Welcome to this Zwerf Bocconi Fafi e lecture on the topic of the crucial role of central banks in coping with the COVID 19 crisis. We are pleased to welcome Christian Upper and John Frost from the BIS today. Christian and John were leading authors of the new BIS annual economic report. Dirk Schumacher from Natixis will moderate the meeting. Let me briefly introduce uh, both speakers. Uh, Christian Upper heads the macroeconomic analysis section of the Monetary and Economics Department of the BIS, and his responsibilities include overseeing the production of the background note of the BIS Global Economy Meetings that brings together central bank governors from 30 central banks from major advanced and emerging uh, market economies and before being appointed at his current position. He headed the BIS Emerging Markets, Financial Market, and Monetary Policy and Exchange Rate sections. Prior to coming to Basel, he spent seven years at the Deutsche Bundesbank. Christian holds a doctorate in economics from the European University Institute in Florence and a master of science in economics from the University of Warwick. His research focuses on the interaction of financial markets and institutions and the macroeconomy. His work has been published in a free academic journals as well in policy publications. And the other speaker, John Frost, is a senior economist in the Innovation and Digital Economy Unit of the Bank of International Settlements. In his role, he conducts policy-oriented research on fintech and digital innovation, and he has published research on big tech and finance, macroprudential policy, and inequality. Previously, John worked at the Financial Stability Board, the Dutch Central Bank, the University in Amsterdam, and in the private sectors in Germany. John is a US citizen. He holds an MA degree in economics from the University of Munich and a PhD in economics from the University of Groningen. He's a research affiliate of the Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance at the University of Cambridge. So with that, uh, I would hand over to Christian. Thank you very much. Okay, what I would like to do is I would like to reflect on the nature of the crisis, of, of the current crisis, and on the role of central banks in the response. And this will draw heavily on chapter one and two of the uh, BIS annual economic report. And John will then present the findings of chapter three, which is on payment system. This was a very unique crisis. It was a truly exogenous crisis. The economic crisis, uh, basically, I think, was less a response to the virus directly, but it was more to the, the staying at home um, uh, caused by the virus, partly containment measures by governments, but also partly so self-imposed um, uh, measures. This is a scatter plot of the uh, change in the GDP forecast for 2020 between January and May on the y-axis and the global mobility tracker by Google in, on the x-axis. And you actually see that countries which had a sharper reduction in mobility had a deeper fall in output or expected fall in output. Now, this holds also, if you do the same thing for official containment um, uh, measures, like stringency measures on the Oxford indicator and a variety of other indicators, but this one is the one which works best. So uh, it was sort of more the reduction in mobility rather than, than the health. I think compared to a previous crisis or previous um, uh, recessions, it was not a response for imbalances in the economy or anything like that. So it was really truly exogenous, which is probably quite rare. The second, um, it was accompanied by true uncertainty. So when the, uh, the outbreak started, we knew very little about uh, the virus. I was steaming up a bunch of old newspapers, and I read an economist article from, uh, from January and said, oh, there's this new virus appearing in China. And, and it was quite interesting to see what they did not know. And um, uh, now we know more, but there's still a lot of stuff that we don't know. And that had a very strong implication for the policy response. So for the health policy response, it was very important. And it was also important for the economic policy response because central banks and governments had to, one could say, to improvise or to decide on the fly as um, new information came in and they became more um, uh, aware of what was going on. The third thing which sets apart this crisis, it was truly global. The great financial crisis in uh, 2007, 8, 9, that was actually not as global. There were a number of countries, probably more than half of the countries in the world, which were affected a bit by the fallout, but they were not really experiencing a crisis of their own or deeply involved in, in the crisis. But this one was a truly global one. Just, I'm not aware of any country which was spared. And 
you can see this on the graph, the blue bars, they show the range of consensus forecasts for 2020 growth made in January. And they're very tight and they're very positive. Not, not deeply, not, not very high, but they were they're sort of positive in, in most economies. And the uh, red bars, they show the, the forecast, the range of forecasts made in June for 2020 growth. And you see that the average forecast deeply negative, except in China. That's one aspect, so this, so this is basically the output cost of the crisis. But the second issue, which is in interesting, is that the, the bands are massive, the ranges are massive, which reflects the true uncertainty. The third point I would like to make with this graph is that it's really global. So all countries that we follow here, which is basically G20 plus, were deeply affected by the crisis, and the only country which uh, a major economy which is expected to grow this year is China. And even there, I think the range is um, uh, a last range into negative territory. Now, a unique crisis calls for a unique policy response. And um, a unique in two senses, like the first one is unique in the terms of scope. So there was an unprecedented range of instruments. Some were known, some new. Um, of an unprecedented coordination of monetary, fiscal, and prudential policies. Oops. And it was also unique in the terms of objectives. So usually when faced with a recession, central banks and uh, governments, they would sort of try to stimulate demand in order to, to prop up output. This time it was not really about stimulating demand, um, at least not in the initial phase of the crisis. It was about offering a lifeline to firms and households to survive during a lockdown. And um, actually, stimulating demand could have been quite counterproductive if people then go out and try to, to, to congregate and uh, spread the virus uh, more quickly. So it was a very, very different response. It was a very vigorous response as well. So if you look at uh, the left hand panel, this is the balance sheet of the Central Bank of Japan, which um, uh, compared to how it evolved um, uh, in the 2008 crisis, well, admittedly, this is a bit an, an extreme comparison. Uh, you see that they didn't really do that much um, uh, in the early stages of the global finance, on the great financial crisis, but they expanded massively this time. With other central banks, the picture is less stark, but it's also it goes in the same direction almost everywhere. And on the right hand panel, you see the number of measures. This is Canada, just an example, but you can take most other um, economies as well. So central banks took a very, very large number of measures in order to support uh, output. This is our take on, you don't have to read everything here. Um, uh, it's, it's more like to give you a broad impression of how much central banks here did. In the end report, we've got a similar um, graph for or table for fiscal policy measures. And so they, they really went in with everything. And central banks started with cutting policy rates, um, uh, shown now in this, in this first line and now highlighted. And that was something which they did in the past. Um, uh, that was, uh, I think, not really the center of the policy response. I think it was more to support um, confidence than to support output um, and demand. Um, it was, I think, more sort of a, 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 yes, a side measure. Not, not unimportant, but, uh, but not at the center of it. More important were these measures. These were sort of lender of last resort measures to the financial system. Liquidity provisions, um, including specialized lending to keep um, banks from, from extend, um, extending credit. Uh, central banks activated their asset purchases, revit um, revitalizing a lot of the programs um, during the uh, great financial crisis. And what is interesting here is that um, uh, it's this right hand uh, part of the, uh, of, of the table. So for the first time, actually, central banks in the emerging markets also bought government bonds. The volumes were much, much smaller than they were in the, in the great financial crisis. But uh, this is something very new. And I think that reflects um, two interlinked um, uh, developments um, over the last um, uh, two decades. The first one is that um, there is actually a liquid government bond market local currency bond market extending with longer maturities in these economies. That was very rare um, uh, before that. 
famous original sin um, metaphor, which says that um, emerging markets ca can't issue long-term government debt in their own currency. The second related uh, topic was that central banks have actually become more credible. So central banks can now get away with this, doing this, with buying um, uh, government bonds, at least in some economies, um, because they have much better inflation targeting um, uh, credentials and uh, much more credibility than the past. And um, a small commercial break. Last year, we actually had in the, the chapter two of um, the annual economic report, the BIS was exactly on this issue. It was on the central bank frameworks in emerging market economies, how they have changed. Let's return to the advanced economies. And there, I think um, the really interesting part of the policy response is sort of the lower part of the asset purchase part, the corporate bonds and other private securities. So the financial system has changed quite considerably over the last 20 years or so. And the role of banks in intermediation has declined. And if you look at the, uh, the role of banks in corporate credit, it ranges in some countries, it's less than 40%, around 40% in the US and in Mexico. And um, in others, it remains high at over 90%, but, uh, but it has fallen across the board. And um, central banks had to adapt to this changed environment and actually maybe become less a lender of last resort, but more a market maker, a dealer, or a buyer of last resort. And um, hence, a lot of the uh, measures, uh, um, um, purchase measures of, um, of private sector security. Now let me skip the FX swap intervention and turn to the prudential rules and regulation. This was also something quite unique and I'm going to zoom into that um, uh, into more detail now. So prudential authorities around the globe have taken a large number of measures at least capital and liquidity requirements, they've imposed blanket distribution restrictions, for instance, on dividends, they eased the classification of exposures, um, uh, um, and they uh, gave sort of, yeah, they eased the accounting treatment of, um, of um, accounting losses. And, and specifically, they sort of suspended the application of um, uh, the expected credit loss provisioning standards in some jurisdictions under some circumstances. So this is, very different from what it is in the past. So in the past, I think regulators had taken usually a very microprudential approach. So looking at individual safety of an individual bank. Now, if you want to safeguard the, 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 an individual bank, you actually don't do that. You do the opposite. You would increase capital requirements and you would um, liquidity requirements and so on. And um, in the course of doing that, if everybody does that, then you would obviously kill the economy, but, um, uh, but at least banks would remain safe. So this is really the first big example of, or the largest example so far, of a proper macroprudential approach to, uh, to prudential policy. So policymakers have not focused on the stability of each bank in isolation, but they focused on the stability of the financial system as a whole. And they viewed banks as part of the solution rather than as part of the problem. So that, I think, is a good thing. And um, uh, certainly Claudio, who has, um, uh, who has been pushing for that for 20 years now, I'm um, uh, probably very happy about this. Now, let's maybe not take uh, this too far, because one of the, the, the true macroprudential uh, instrument in the Basel III framework, which is the counter-cyclical capital buffer, which is the one on the top of this, um, of, of uh, the top bar, that's actually the least used of, uh, of the various prudential actions. So less than a third of uh, Basel member, um, uh, Basel committee member jurisdictions actually used this, uh, used this instrument. And why didn't they use it more? Um, I think the main reason is if you want to lower the particularly capital buffer, you have to increase it in the first place. So it's, it's not clear that that many countries had actually used this, um, uh, this, this measure that much. Okay, why were bank, um, uh, central banks or macroprudential authorities able to, to follow this macroprudential approach? I think a very, very big part of that was that banks enter the crisis with much more capital than they had in the past. And if you look at the left-hand panel of this graph, 
uh, the blue bars, these are the bank's capitalizations in 2006. This is a sample of, of um, uh, I don't know whether it's systemically important banks or, or, or large banks. I think this definitely includes all the, uh, the cities, but I think it's a larger sample than that. And um, the average capital ratio um, uh, the, uh, before the uh, global financial crisis was just falling short of 12% um, of risk-weighted assets. Today, it's around 17% of, uh, of uh, risk-weighted assets, or it was at the end of last year. And there's a lot of banks which hold significant excess capital above the, uh, the pillar one minimum, minima. And you see that on the right-hand panel. Uh, so that's something which clearly held, um, uh, that, that meant that supervisors didn't have to fight about each individual bank, but they could actually lower buffers and, in order to keep banks lending. Fiscal policy responded with a speed that was probably unprecedented. Fiscal authorities adjusted their fiscal response as, they, as the crisis progressed, as new information came in, as they saw whether certain measures worked or did not work. Very often they expanded um, sort of previous tools um, like furlough schemes or cost survive, short-term work to keep employees attached to their firms and preserve um, good matches. And the other element which was really important, and that's the, the, the blue bars, this were guarantees um, on loans. So the aim was to allow firms to borrow in order to bridge funding gaps and cash flow gaps. These guarantees were either extended to borrow, which basically meant that the private sector banks could uh, lend, or in some cases they were extended to central banks. For instance, in the US, the Fed took the equity tranche of a fund put up by the Fed, which would buy, um, uh, which would give loans to private enterprises. In the UK, um, the Treasury um, basically um, pays an immunity to the Bank of England for taking credit risk. So the Bank of England can provide funding, but does not suffer the credit risk associated with it, which could, um, uh, could reduce independence. The three strands of the response, monetary, prudential, and fiscal, seems to have worked in the sense that they have stabilized markets. So you see that markets have recovered to a large extent from their, 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 their troughs um, in, the, in, in, in March. Spreads have narrowed, they're not, not fully, but, um, but they have narrowed. To the extent that actually some people will think that uh, markets have gone too far and equity valuations are sort of completely detached from, from fundamentals. Credit has been kept flowing, and I think that's the aim of this macroprudential approach. Banks continue to lend in the US, partly involuntary because um, uh, firms which were shut out of markets drew on the credit guarantees, uh, but also in the euro area where credit guarantees uh, mat do not matter that much. And that's very different from the GFC um, where credit shrunk in, in most economies affected. And the economy, I think, is recovering as well. I don't have a slide on that, but we actually do see some recovery of the, of, of the economy. Now, the drop has been dramatic. Um, uh, we're not yet back to the pre-crisis level of output, and it will take quite some time until we're there. But I would not want to imagine how deep output would drop and how slowly it would recover without all these um, uh, policy measures. There are significant challenges ahead, and some are because of the, the result of the outbreak and of containment measures. Some, I think, could be a side effect of some of the policy measures. There, which doesn't necessarily mean that they were wrong, but even good things come at a price. And I would like to uh, draw attention to two uh, challenges. The first one is we could see rising insolvencies ahead. So firms have borrowed massively in the first half of this year, had little cash flow. Before already we had seen uh, rising corporate debt to, to GDP ratios in a number of economies, not in all economies, um, definitely it was, it was a number of economies. And even in these economies, it was mostly in a certain section of the, uh, the corporate uh, sector. So it was not an across the board uh, increase in, uh, in leverage. But some firms have become very leveraged indeed even before that, and they may become even more leveraged um, uh, during the crisis. We have already seen a wave of downgrades and negative watch announcements at the right-hand panel of, um, uh, of the slide. But this could go come again. So we could actually see a, a, a wave of, um, uh, of default when central banks slowly um, 
and governments um, would draw, would draw the, uh, the stimulus, the funding, the lifeline to, to firms, and output does not recover in some of the sectors. So that's, that's, I think, one challenge ahead. And this is obviously much worse if we have a second wave of outbreaks and uh, new containment measures. And uh, would probably much easier to manage if we have a D-shaped recovery, um, which basically puts the development of the virus, the epidemiological factors, also into the spotlight. The second challenge is for banks. So banks have been part of the solution, but they have taken on a lot of credit risk. Maybe not new credit risk because this was lent, but, um, uh, but the credit worthiness of existing borrowers has probably in all likelihood uh, declined. And you see that in the left-hand panel, you see actually the provisions in Q1 of a broad sample of banks, they have increased quite significantly. Rating agencies have been aware of that and have um, reduced not uh, the rating outlook of many banks. And there haven't been many downgrades yet, but uh, many banks have been put on negative watch. And bank stocks have underperformed markets, so banks could sort of come under, under some pressure. Colleagues of mine made some simulations of how much um, uh, capital could be depleted under stress scenarios. Um, you find it on the BIS website and on the slides, there's a reference to them. A third challenge posed by the, the policy response and the, and, and the crisis is that um, fiscal deficits have widened massively in 2020. And they should widen. So from any economic standpoint, that's what you would want to have. Uh, unfortunately, this also leads to the steepest increase in government debt since the great financial crisis. And government debt being high already in some countries, this could, could pose challenges in some economies. This is an issue because at some point we will need to deal with issues like insolvencies, debt restructuring. And if some firms have need to adjust their business models or would, will not be able to serve the debt, um, old debt or the ones contracted during the, the crisis. And that's something which central banks can't really do. So central banks can lend and they can deal with liquidity problems, but they're not good at dealing with solvency problems. They can't really allocate resources and they can't really accelerate restructuring. What is needed is sort of more formal mechanisms and maybe informal mechanisms of, um, of resolving these um, insolvency issues. Formal mechanisms would include bankruptcies and, uh, and the like. Now, there's already reports in some countries that bankruptcy courts are becoming overburdened and will not be able to deal with the uh, huge increase in the, in, the, in, the, in the caseload. So this basically calls for informal mechanisms to restructure the debt of firms which would actually be viable, but which are over indebted. And I think here it's important that the government plays a role. The first one is the government sets the rules. But there's also, there could, there could be an issue that um, uh, there could be a, it could, could be important for the government to play, also put its purse at, uh, at disposal and uh, maybe offer equity stakes to, to firms. So you socialize not only the losses, which in many cases happened anyway, and we will happen anyway because of the guarantees, but you also have some upside to the, for the, for the public purse. The broader government, central bank, and regulatory authorities can play a role because they can actually provide incentives for banks to restructure debt quickly. I think that's something very important. So there's a big literature out there on, on crisis, and that generally finds that countries which restructure debt more quickly and uh, resolve these issues more quickly um, uh, allow firms to raise equities, um, uh, address any stability issues in the banking system, they tend to recover much more quickly. Now, an issue going forward will be monitoring and fiscal interactions. The interesting thing during the crisis is that there was a coincidence of aims. So basically everybody went in and tried to support the economy because this was in line with the central bank's mandate. There were no inflationary pressures, anything deflationary pressures. With the government's mandates and also with the prudential authorities' mandates, which have become more macroprudential. And that basically means that sort of the talk of monetary financing which has been floating around in the media at the moment doesn't really make that much sense because this coincidence of aims basically means that central banks have actually acted according to the mandate and that's the first issue the second one is the purchase in government security is part of monetary policy operations so that's, that's nothing new there i think that the key question of whether this is monetary financing or not is who is in control and then what happens once um, these, uh, the objectives diverge, once there's a conflict, a trade-off between these, 
very subjective. When inflation picks up in term, and central bank money is what's called for a tighter policy. This is, I think, when, uh, when things become interesting. Um, before that, I think the issue of monetary financing is not that particularly relevant. It's, it's a lot of rhetoric, not that much substance. There's a box on that in the annual economics report. Let me stop here and pass on the word to John. Thank you very much, Christian. John, the, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks a lot to Christian, and thanks a lot to um, to Dirk and uh, and, and Anis um, for, um, for the introduction for setting this, uh, this up. So Christian has discussed uh, chapters one and two of the annual economic reports, um, and you know the pandemic and the centrality of, of central banks in the policy response. Chapter three actually picks up those topics as well. So there is um, a red line flowing through. So chapter three covers central banks and payments in the digital era. And this takes a rather long perspective, as you can see also from, uh, from the cover slides. This shows uh, the history of the means of payment through the centuries, from cowrie shells to Lydian coins, tally sticks, through to the first ledgers, uh, the first ATMs, and now uh, the number of digital uh, payment methods, including central bank digital currencies. The reason for, for writing about this uh, was that there has been a lot of disruption in payments in the past few years. So first there was Bitcoin and its cryptocurrency cousins, which were the subject of a special chapter of the annual economic report in 2018. Then there was the entry of big tech into finance, which often started in payments and then extended into other areas like credit, insurance, wealth management, etc. That was the subject of last year's chapter. And finally, uh, as you all know, there was the Facebook Libra proposal, a so-called global stablecoin and a perceived threat to monetary sovereignty in many countries. And that unleashed quite a bit of debate, uh, not least now on, on central bank digital currencies, work that had already been um, taking place before, but that has um, certainly uh, become uh, somewhat more prominent in the public debate, at least. But overall, payment markets are changing, and this chapter of the annual economic report seeks to show the economics of these markets and the foundational role of central banks in them. So the topic was decided well before the pandemic, but of course, um, much like uh, the, the material that, that Christian presented before, the pandemic has had a very large impact on the payments markets already. So the pandemic um, has underscored why these issues are so important. For one thing, the pandemic has already had a big impact on retail payment behavior. For instance, it spurred contactless card payments, which are shown here on the slide. And it's also led to an increase in remote payments for things like online shopping. And the mirror image of this is that there's been a decline in use of cash for daily transactions, in part because of fears of uh, viral transmission through cash. Scientific evidence shows that those fears are, are probably overdone. The, the risks of cash are, are low compared to other frequently touched surfaces. But this has also been something that has spurred people to use digital uh, methods of payment. Moreover, um, as Christian was emphasizing, governments have responded to the pandemic uh, with, with fiscal outlays, including direct payments to households, so-called government person payments. Some governments have been able to use bank credit transfers or even new digital means like electronic wallets. Others have relied on paper checks and prepaid cards, uh, which have taken time to arrive in the mail and have sometimes gotten lost or stolen. In the United States, for instance, um, Checks have been sent to 1 million deceased individuals. So this shows some of the, um, the shortcomings in the payment system that have been uh, that made apparent in the current crisis. So overall, the pandemic has underscored both progress and the remaining challenges in payments. So the chapter also discusses the policy goals in payments, including safety and integrity, which is foundational. Here, the central bank plays a pivotal role. It then looks at shortcomings in areas like access, cost, and quality of payments. So to start with access, there's been a lot of progress in the past few years as seen in the rising share of adults with a bank account in every region of the world. This progress has been very notable, particularly in South Asia, uh, driven by India and the so-called India stack, that's the black line. Also in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's the line at the bottom, there's been a lot of progress driven uh, in large part by mobile money. But still, even in advanced economies, uh, like the United States, there are significant shares of consumers who are unbanked or un, uh, underbanked. As we show in this graph in the chapter uh, from an FDIC survey, this correlates with race in the United States.
happens in Black and Hispanic households are much more likely to be unbanked or underbanked. Um, in the euro area, lower income households are more likely to be unbanked. Now, if we look at costs, we see that payments are relatively more expensive where banking sector competition is lower, proxied by banks' net interest margins. This chart uses McKinsey data. And if we look across payment instruments, we see that debit and credit cards are relatively more costly, at least for merchants. That's shown here on a chart based on a survey from the European Commission. Merchants pay fees to banks and to card networks, which are not transparent to consumers, and these costs can add up. So to discuss these issues and what policy can do, the chapter uses the metaphor of a town market, like the one in Bago on market cuts. Uh, a town market has buyers and sellers whose presence is mutually reinforcing. Um, and by allowing free entry and uh, free consumer choice, uh, a town market is able to uh, contribute to a well-functioning marketplace. In the open marketplace, everyone can buy from everyone. There's competition between providers and choice for consumers. This marketplace doesn't arise on its own. For instance, in Basel, the town authorities run the market, setting the standards for opening hours, food safety, the placement of stalls, etc. In the context of payments, this open marketplace is the market of the model we are encouraging. Households and businesses should have access to choices between different payment service providers. You can see here a bank, a card network, a smartphone-based payment interface, and they should compete on a level playing field. To ensure this, there needs to be an authority operating the marketplace, catalyzing the use of standards, and overseeing its safety and integrity. That authority is the central bank. There are different ways that central banks can support an open market. One is by directly providing key payment infrastructures. In the last years, a growing number of central banks have launched or play a key operational role in so-called fast payment systems, uh, shown on the red line here. Fast payment systems allow 24-7 payments between individuals. So think of Koji in Mexico, the new FIX system they launched in Brazil, the unified payments interface in India, which is operated by a private sector consortium, but with a key role for the Reserve Bank of India, and the Fed now proposal in the United States. And of course, in the euro area, there's um, uh, uh, TIPS and also uh, the uh, private RT1. So these are just a few examples of retail fast payment systems, which can be either publicly or privately uh, provided, but usually with a key operational role for the central bank. This diffusion of retail fast payment systems is following the same path as real-time gross settlement or RTGS systems two decades ago. You can see that an increasing number of jurisdictions around the world now have access to some systems, and this is driving uh, lower costs, higher quality and convenience of payments, and in some cases also greater access to payment services. So central banks can also stand at the cutting edge themselves. In particular, a growing number of central banks are researching or piloting central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs. In the chapter, uh, we discuss these trends, the motivations for CBDCs, and the, the clear shift in attitudes that's taken place in the past year. So, for instance, this chart, which is from research um, by myself, Raphael Auer, and Julia Cornelli, in a, a forthcoming GIS working paper, um, also shown in the annual account report chapter. Uh, we see that in the past few months, uh, the stance in central banks' speeches towards CBDCs has turned more positive. So here the red bars is a, are our cumulative count of speeches that uh, mention CBDC in a negative light, saying, for instance, that the central bank does not have plans to issue a CBDC or elaborating on the many risks and downsides, which I'll get back to in a moment. Blue bars are speeches with a positive stance towards CBDCs, mentioning, for instance, that research is ongoing or that a CBDC project is being piloted. This is also broken down into retail and wholesale uh, mentions. So you can see that over time, uh, there have been more and more positive mentions of retail and wholesale CBDCs. Interestingly, there are almost no negative mentions of wholesale CBDCs, only at retail. But since February of this year, you can actually see this black line, which measures the net stance, has crossed the x-axis. So there are now cumulatively four central bank speeches in the BIS central bank speeches database mentioned CBDCs in a positive light. 
And as many of you know, the People's Bank of China, Serbia Swiss Bank, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, and several others are actually piloting CBDCs. Um, in, in the euro area, of course, the ECB has also um, discussed uh, research on, on CBDP and some national central banks, uh, including the Dutch Central Bank, the Baltic Falls, and others um, have also published work on CBDCs. So the motivation for central bank digital currencies differ across countries. In many cases, the goal is to promote safety and robustness or domestic payments efficiency. There's also quite a bit of research on CBDCs looking at financial stability implications. Uh, this is quite important, again, as I'll come back to. Uh, especially in emerging market and developing economies, financial inclusion is a key driver. And this chart comes from a CPMI survey last year uh, in the BIS paper published by uh, Claudio Savoir, uh, Henry Holden, and Amber Wadsworth, uh, impending arrival, um, which discusses uh, the results of this survey on, on CBDCs. Now, as I mentioned, uh, central bank digital currencies um, may, be, may have very far-reaching implications. There's been a lot of discussion about financial stability implications, such as the uh, digital runs. So the idea that um, people may convert bank deposits into CBDCs in times of stress, and this could accelerate uh, run out of the banking system. There's also discussion of disintermediation. So the risk um, that the central bank will end up having a much larger footprint in the system, that this could um, deprive banks of deposit funding uh, with which to lend. There have been a lot of discussions of potential remedies, tiering, um, you know, having uh, caps on uh, the amount of CBDC that individuals can hold. These are ongoing discussions. Um, there are quite a few discussions between central banks on the exact design choices. In any case, um, we show in the chapter that uh, these discussions are very important. Central banks are facing very similar challenges across countries, and therefore international coordination on these issues is very important. So overall, CBDCs could have very far-reaching implications for financial stability, also monetary policy transmission, data privacy and information security, and the nature of the relationship of the central bank with society. But if we look at the long history of payment innovations, CBDCs could be a fairly important next step. The chapter touches on these issues and notes that central banks are taking these issues very uh, carefully into consideration. So with this, I'd like to close and very happy along with Christian to answer questions. Thank you very much, John, for this interesting presentation. And I have the prerogative now to ask a first round of questions, and I'm going to make full use of that. The first one for Christian would be, it doesn't sound as um, you're, you're really worried about a banking crisis at this point. Uh, banks are a lot more capitalized. And if I understood this chart you showed on these different scenarios, how much a crisis could eat into banks' capital, that didn't look too frightening, I must say. Uh, but of course, depending on how, how deep this recession is, what kind of rebound in activity we get, this could uh, look quite different. But am, am I interpreting right what you show that, at least so far, the risk of a banking crisis seems, seems rather small, not least because we've learned some of the lessons in the past. And then a second question, central banks' balance sheet. When uh, will they start normalizing and should they, in a sense, not just stopping net purchases of sovereign debt or other assets, but should central banks start shrink their balance sheet back to some kind of normal ratio, whatever that it is? Is, is it needed? Can, can we live for a very long time with very big central banks balance sheet or is, is, is there any other um, factor at work that makes it necessary that central banks at some point need to shrink their balance sheet uh, back to, to normal? And for John, I would have two questions as well. Um, the first uh, is, is, are there any redeeming qualities of cash? Do we need cash going forward or is this move towards digital currency and, and, and all that uh, clearly a positive and it's only a matter of time until nobody will pay with cash? Well, is there anything we, we could still use cash for? And I'm also thinking here in the context of the potential uh, conflict of interest Christian mentioned for central banks when they have to choose at some point potentially rising inflation, how to fight inflation or to keep governments afloat, uh, whether cash might be something that is invaluable in, in that kind of uh, situation. But what are the implications for the FX market of all that? When, when I heard you talk about all the implications it has on, on central bank implementation of policy and so on and so forth. 
Will further spreading of CBCD uh, weaken the role of the dollar? Does it make competition between currencies easier or, or will it strengthen the position of the dollar globally? Do you have any views on that? The risk of a banking crisis, <clears throat> to say that uh, there, there's not going to be a banking crisis nowhere in the world in the next few years and so on, that's something which I obviously can't say and I don't know. There are a number of factors which I think make banking crises less likely than they would have made them at other similar uh, sharp recessions. The first one is the much, much better capitalization of banks and um, the, the larger buffers. And for the stress test, that the, the exercise that we did, or, but also the, the Fed stress test, and they showed that they should be that these buffers should suffice under certain scenarios. Of course, you can build a constructive scenario in which every banking system would go bust. The buffers are much, much larger. That's a very important issue. The second one is that a lot of the, the new lending has been accompanied by gar government guarantees. It's not that banks have taken on that much additional credit risk during a crisis, at least not across the board. In individual cases, yes. The risk of a banking crisis, I'm not sure whether it's zero or not, but it's certainly much lower than it would be in a similar situation um, only 10 years ago. And the central bank balance sheets, I mean, the Fed's balance sheet is already shrinking, actually, because um, uh, other central banks, especially, well, especially in Europe and Japan, they're drawing less on the on, on the dollar swaps. Uh, whether they should shrink further or not, the answer is not clear. Some central banks, especially in Asia, have lived with very large central bank balance sheets um, uh, relative to GDP for, for decades, and they've lived with that quite well. It certainly has not led to inflation. Some of these countries have extremely low, if anything, too low inflation rates. It, similar in advanced economies, you have had very different sizes of balance sheets historically. I mean, the Fed's balance sheet was much, much smaller than the ones of by central banks in Europe, for example. The central bank balance sheet has to be seen in the context of how the institution arrangements with the private intermediation work and um, whether somebody wants to hold the balances at the central bank and so on and so forth. So if these patterns also change, if sort of, um, uh, agents would like to continue to hold reserves at the central bank, perhaps because the intermediation has changed, perhaps because they hold more really high quality um, collateral, then I don't see why central bank balance sheets would necessarily have to shrink. It's very hard to make precise statements on that. The experience of the last 10 years have shown that it's much more difficult to shrink central bank balance sheets to then expand them. So we had, uh, well, not taper tantrum or something else, but in the, in, in, the, in the US, for instance, you had sort of the Fed actually shrinking the balance sheet and actually trying to phase out uh, securities by at least stopping to, to, to reinvest. And that was sort of accompanied with some um, unease by market participants, and at some point they stopped because they actually realized that the sort of steady state balance sheet was much larger than they than it was before, and um, than they, they than they, they had anticipated in certain scenarios. So I think central bank balance sheets will probably remain large for for the time being. Whether it will remain large forever, we don't know. So, uh, Dirk, you asked, are there redeeming qualities of cash? Do we still need cash? And I think the answer is yes uh, on both questions. So one redeeming quality of cash is that it is very insensitive to outages. So in, uh, you know, if, if we had a severe cyber attack, if we had um, you know, any, any disruptions, uh, cash, of course, um, can, can be used uh, independently of technology. The second very important, very important uh, redeeming quality of cash is that it's accessible to everyone. So including senior citizens, uh, children, you know, the, the, there are features um, of cash for the visually impaired in a number of countries. So it's, uh, there are a number of consumers who rely on cash and it's of course an important element in, in financial inclusion. Uh, privacy is very important. So this is something that, you know, there's a lot of debate now about uh, with regard to central bank digital currencies. There are technological capabilities that would allow small transactions, you know, to, to ensure privacy for, for small transactions. But there is a balancing act with market integrity and anti-money laundering, combating the financing of terrorism. So I think that the, the discussion on CBDC is uh, not necessarily about replacing cash, it's about creating a complement to cash. And you can see that even in countries like Sweden, where cash use is declining very rapidly, uh, the central bank um, you know, is certainly working on ensuring access to cash. That central bank digital currencies would be an additional form of money, so in addition to cash and coins, commercial bank deposits, 
and, and, and commercial banks um, in problems with the central bank. Now there would also be uh, CBDCs. So it's, I think, more of a complement than a substitute. Um, and there are also a lot of discussion on, on how to make CBDCs cash-like uh, to kind of Im imitate the perfection that's been, been achieved with, uh, with cash while mitigating some of the risks. The implications for the FX markets, would CBDC weaken or strengthen the international role of the dollar? I think there have been a lot of discussions on this, you know, what the geopolitics of CBDC, particularly since the People's Bank of China is very advanced in its own work. I think that these discussions may be a bit overblown. The Digital uh, Currency Electronic Payments Program, as the Chinese uh, CBDC project is called, is very much focused on domestic use. I think that it should be seen in the context of the Chinese payments market that currently has a duopoly in mobile payments between Alipay and WeChat Pay. So there are private digital wallets that have you know 94% market share between them. Uh, the central bank is, is trying to offer something that um, is, uh, is risk-free and that um, is offered by the central bank uh, to the public through intermediaries. So this is very much a domestic use case. There has been discussion on you know what this could mean for, for cross-border use, and I think central banks are thinking about these issues very carefully how to make CBDCs accessible to tourists, but not necessarily um, an instrument of speculation or of, of runs between, uh, between countries. But I think that um, most of the retail CBDC discussion is very much domestically focused. And I don't think that um, we're expecting you know, very large implications for the FX market in the short term. Finally, um, I saw that there was a question uh, through the chat um, uh, from, uh, I think it was from Rose. This was on the hard cross-country empirical evidence for the impact of COVID-19 on payments behavior, will this be lasting? Will there be impacts, has there been an impact of COVID on central bank stance on CBDCs? And there, I think that um, evidence is coming in. So the, the contactless payments uh, have, have certainly been, been one, that's, that's what I showed. Um, there's also impact, uh, been an impact on, um, on remote payments. How lasting this will be, we don't know, but we do know that there is quite a bit of inertia in payments behavior. So when people start using different means of payment, they often continue to do so after the initial shock, so there may well be a long-lasting impact of, uh, of the pandemic on how people pay. Thank you, John. There are indeed quite a few questions now in the chat. For example, this one is, I guess, for Christian. Given unprecedented monetary expansion and falling um, output, where does inflation go? So how inflationary or disinflationary is, is this all going to be? In, in the short term, the answer is relatively clear. I mean, the, the inflation will go down. There's massive slack in the economy. There is there may be higher costs in some industries, uh, but there's also lower demand. So I think in, in, in the pretty short term, I think all observers would agree that inflation would be more likely to undershoot um, than, than, than to overshoot. Now, in the medium term, I think in the end, we, we don't know. I showed this graph on the uh, consensus forecast for, for output. If you do the same thing for inflation, but um, uh, next year's inflation, the bands are extremely wide. There could be scenarios in which um, inflation goes up, but there could be scenarios where inflation goes down quite, quite considerably. This depends on, uh, first of all, how much slack there will be in the economy a year down the road. I mean, even if output has fallen massively in some industries, doesn't mean that there's slack in the sense that output could go back to the pre-crisis level. The output may never come back in some industries. We don't know this stage, but this may not happen if there's a vaccine soon, but if there's no vaccine, then uh, output will probably not come back in certain industries and slack could evaporate quickly, not because um, output has increased, but because potential in, in certain industries has, has, has fallen um, uh, massively. So we could actually see some factors which push up inflation. You could also have an issue, I think, on inflation expectations. So it was quite interesting. During the lockdown, the official headline inflation indices, they fell in almost all economies, except some emerging markets where food prices went up. But these indices are pretty meaningless during that period because they have stuff like hotels and their travel and um, car purchases. These things were not just not done, these purchases. Of course, were not available. There have been some attempts to look at actual um, uh, price indices based on the lockdown, the goods consumed during the lockdowns, and they showed higher rates of inflation. If we continue to have like a large difference between measured inflation and experienced inflation, this could have uh, affect um, households' inflation expectations and make them unanchored. And that would be another possibility to 
uh, and this could feed into higher wage demands. And so, and so there's a number of scenarios with which you could sort of imagine that inflation could go up. How likely they are um, in the short term, probably not likely at all. In the medium term, I think um, it depends very much on the policy response and it depends very much on what central banks do, whether they react to them. Thanks. There's another question uh, to you then. Central banks can lend but cannot spend. Uh, that's what you said during the presentation. Within this constraint, central banks could purchase perpetual bonds from governments to mitigate the impact of the crisis on public finances. What is your view on this approach? Well, I'm not sure whether central banks can obviously finance the government, and there have been many instances of countries where it, it has happened. I think there's two questions. The first one is how much would the government actually gain from doing that? Because in almost all countries, the central bank is actually owned by the government and pays dividends to the government. The central bank could sort of um, transfer money to the government by making profits or by making uh, or, or by buying certain instruments, or and they could also buy short-term government debt and roll, roll it over. I'm not sure whether long buying perpetual bonds or so um, is, is, is a huge difference. But what matters, I think, for the whether it makes sense to to have um, government financing is. From a from purely um, short-term fiscal point of view, is whether the interest that the central bank pays on its liabilities are lower than that that the government pays, and um, and that's not that clear all all the cases, especially with a with a very low yield and flat yield curve at the moment. I think the gains from actually having the central bank um, uh, printing money and, and maybe raising questions about its independence, the fiscal gains would actually be quite small. Now, going. For further and, and some economies, then is, there's the issue. Okay, do you want actually do people want to hold central bank liabilities? And I lived in Latin America some time, and um, uh, and during that time, um, whenever governments resorted to the central bank as a fund of last resort, basically people bought dollars. We're not there in the advanced economies, but uh, this is something which I think if, if people lose their faith in, in central banks and they believe that some banks become a branch of government, and like a funding branch, this is something which, which could happen, and I don't think there's anybody who wants that, because we have actually learned from history that this is a, it's maybe not the worst of all outcomes, but it's much, much inferior to the outcomes that we have at the moment. So yes, central banks can help the government to fund um, as long as somebody holds that, but it's not that they can sort of, that it makes sense for them to, uh, for, for the government to rely on the central banks to do that, and if it does rely on that on an excessive scale, then at some point um, they will lose the ability to do that, and um, the currency will, will sort of lose its value. Thank you. There would be another question for, for you, I guess. With interest rates at historic lows and private and public debt at historic highs, what does that mean for the sustainable balance between monetary and fiscal policy? I guess that, that's a question we are which you already alluded in your presentation, i.e. There, there might come a time when there's a clear conflict of interest between what a central bank can do uh, to, well, be faithful to its mandate when it comes to inflation. Uh, at the same time, um, be aware that um, some governments, maybe all governments, need a fiscal backstop. Is, is that inevitably at some point leading towards a big clash or calamity for central banks and they have to choose sides, so to speak? Well, I mean, I think at some point you will have shocks which drive up inflation and if um, mandates um, uh, call for low inflation, central banks will have to raise interest rates. So there could be conflicts of interest in the short term um, between the government and the central bank and then the question is what the central bank does. And of course, if uh, you have for instance, financial stability issues that um, the private sector can't uh, really um, stomach any increase in interest rates, this would lead to a financial crisis or so on, then you have a big, big, big problem. There are solutions to that. Uh, first of all, that's not imminent, but there are also solutions to it. I mean, you can make the financial system less sensitive to, to, to rate hikes so that um, people, the firms don't go bust um, or households don't go under because um, interest rates um, increase. To some extent, this has happened because uh, there's a lot of long-term debt now in the system, much longer term than, than, than a few decades ago. So the, the sensitivity of, for instance, households to interest rates um, increases has fallen in many economies. So, so I think there's ways out of it, but this conflict could appear, and at some point, if there's these shocks, which is likely, that it, 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 it will appear, and then mandates are relatively clear. I mean, central banks in most countries have the mandate it's almost a lexicographic mandate or it's a dual mandate um, uh, 
to where inflation is, plays an enormously important role. And uh, not many central banks have a mandate to keep funding costs. So. I guess in the euro area, there's another wrinkle to that story in a sense that a big country like Italy, high debt levels, and uh, they could easily see a, a situation where uh, investors are not willing to hold that debt, where you have a self-fulfilling prophecy here. Uh, the question for the ECB then is always is then often not just one uh, or governments, um, am I safe mandate in, um, in terms of fighting inflation or keeping inflation a target? But also the existence of the euro is then always put in question. So the, the, the conflict or the, the problem in the euro area is, is a manifold higher always because it, it easily gets an, uh, becomes a more fundamental problem um, that could endanger the whole existence of the, the currency union. While I can see in the UK or the US or other countries uh, that conflict is, is easier to manage. There are also two statements on um, cash, the mean quality of cash on the chat, which certainly I would echo the one uh, that's a guarantee for personal freedom and independence. You would need, in a world without cash, you will have to have a lot of in policy makers and governments. Um, I guess so. I, I would fully agree with that. It's, it's good to have some, some safety valve uh, for, for people they can go to if uh, for whatever reason, policymakers should not be as enlightened as we would like to have them. There's another question. Um, there has been efforts by regulators in certain uh, geographies to ensure MDR is realistic and in, in, uh, in interchange is in control. How can such progressive regulations percolate in other geographies? First of all, just to return on, on cash, um, I agree with Andrea. So I, I had mentioned the three advantages of cash, and Andrea added a few other ones, including budget controls. And actually, that's very interesting because a number of surveys do show that uh, there are quite a few consumers who see cash as a, as a simple means of controlling their budgets, and the competition with other means of payment is, is absolutely true as well. There are downsides of cash which we know about, um, so including market integrity issues. You know, uh, cash is also very popular with drug dealers um, and, and criminals and for terrorist financing. And of course, cash provision isn't free. Central banks do expend quite a bit of uh, money and, and effort on making cash available. And so, so dear, I mean, you were mentioning if we you know, don't have trust in authorities, cash is still there. But we do need to trust central banks to have cash there in the first place. And, uh, and it would be the same uh, same institution, of course, working on, on central bank digital currencies um, as a complement to cash. Regarding um, the, the question here from, from Krishna Kumar, um, yes, there have been caps on interchange fees for credit cards in a number of jurisdictions. So in the European Union, for instance, there are caps on the amount that, um, that card networks can charge and this is actually the payments between the issuing, issuing and the acquiring banks. So it's not payments to the card network itself, but rather the payments between banks for accepting card payments. And those caps have been very effective. We actually show um, some charts in, in the chapter, you know, how, how uh, costs of, of card payments have fallen after uh, caps on interchange fees. And we also show that for the, uh, you know, any level of competition in the banking sector, there are lower fees in those jurisdictions like the European Union um, that have, um, have these caps. So um, there is World Bank data showing that uh, these regulations are percolating uh, in other geographies. So there are more and more um, uh, jurisdictions that are following the EU's lead um, and that are also instituting these caps. And that may well be um, a socially optimal uh, regulation given the two-sided nature of, of card payment markets and the fact that um, there, there can be um, market failures leading to excessive fees otherwise. Thank you. You said, Christian, there's a unique crisis. To what extent will this have long-lasting impact on how we view the world? Is the world now generally more risky in a sense that we have to update our the leaves, our, our, the distribution of shocks, how we see the world, that there's a long, um, scaring effect um, that it seemed not possible or um, nobody would have expected. I guess if at the beginning of this year you would ask people what could go wrong this year, a pandemic uh, shutting down the global economy uh, would probably not have been higher on, on that list. Doesn't that force us and also together with the, the, um, the financial crisis um, that maybe the world is a lot more volatile, more risky than we think and what are the, the implications for for growth, trend growth, and how should central banks prepare for a, a lot more uncertain world? Or maybe it's not, maybe this is indeed just a one-off and, and the way we uh, or policymakers have responded will 
everything will be fine uh, shortly and and therefore we don't we do not need to update our beliefs how the world actually is well, I, I think the, 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 the simple answer is, I, I mean, obviously I don't know because nobody knows, but there are parts where we could actually see long-lasting impact. I mean, the first one is we actually have um, higher debt levels in private and the public sector. That's very clearly going to have an impact. And we know that there's a relationship between debt levels and growth, which is not in favor of us. So and unless this changes for some reason, um, this could actually dampen trend growth. The mechanisms still need to be worked out. There's a, a number of mechanisms, and um, it's not God-given that this relationship exists, but um, at least it's, it's there in the data, um, or at least many people claim it is there. There's some concrete things. Um, I think um, firms will look at their global value chains, and they will try to make them more robust. It could be that they make them more robust in the short term, and then they realize, okay, this is more expensive, and I'm losing margin, and they will sort of extend them as before. That's possible, but it's also possible that they will sort of make them more robust and shorten them considerably. And that could be a very, very big issue, especially for, for some emerging markets, countries like Thailand, for instance, which um, uh, are trying to move out of tourism into, into manufacturing. If global value chains get shorter, this is, is going to be extremely difficult for these countries. Many industries are going to see their business models change. So at least for some years, I would expect people to be more reluctant to go into places that involve large gatherings. It could actually be that, um, that people are less willing to sit in crowded aircraft for a long period of time, and this obviously has, will have long-term implications for, for these sectors. To the global value chain, the crisis has definitely led to protectionist tendencies to gain even more of an upper hand than, than they had, which was quite ironic because it actually started when the, the trade conflict sort of seemed to subside at least for some time and, um, and things seem to be getting better, but we could actually see some deglobalization and that could lead to, to lower growth in, in the future. So I think there's a number of possible lasting impacts. Higher health expenditure would be another one. So I think that there, there, there are factors which, which sort of would be gloomy, but there's also one which I think is on the positive side. So for instance, our ability to use digital uh, tools has improved massively, notwithstanding hiccups. A few months ago, we would probably not have thought that we could pull off so many WebEx meetings relatively smoothly. It has been a shot in the arm of innovation, so this could actually work in the other way and could actually accelerate structural change, which could actually be, be a good thing as well, with costs in the short term, but good in the long term. Thank you. John, do you view the, the world as a lot more scarier place? Yeah, there there are certainly very very scary trends, and you know I, I discussed some of the payments, which I think is is perhaps a more more hopeful story. So just to pick up on on the point that Christian just made, I mean we're seeing that the crisis has accelerated certain trends already in digitalization, which brings benefits and, and risks. One of the risks is the exclusion of, of certain groups. So I mean the, there is a more general worry that the crisis may uh, accentuate uh, may increase inequality. And that's also visible in, in payments where certain groups you know, may lack access to some of the digital means of payment that are, are taking off. At the same time, um, I think that um, there can be long lasting benefits. You know, a lot of innovation has come out of crises in the past. Just to name one example, you know, we understand that e-commerce, which is now booming in China and has you know, been, been very important in the last decades, also took you know, a big jump after the SARS pandemic in 2002 and three. So it could well be that you know this this pandemic as well you know leads to many structural changes in the economy. This could actually you know even lead to longer product, uh, higher productivity growth uh, in some cases in the long run. But it'll certainly have a disparate impact. Some industries will benefit and others will be the um, hard hit. It'll we'll have a disparate impact on individuals and households. And so it's very important to have strong authorities that are able to guide um, developments in the right direction and, and ensure the public interest even after a shock like this. We're now past our time, and thank you very much again, Christian and John. Thank you, dear Christian and, and John, and to all participants for your interesting questions. This concludes our webinar for today. Thanks to all of you. Have a nice day, have a nice weekend, and have a nice summer. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.